And good afternoon and uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Evan Wiener, and hopefully we'll see you in person sooner than later. I've been doing a couple talks at uh, Atria's, um, actually in three Atria's, in uh, Rosalind along with uh, Darian and uh, Rybrook. And it's June, and it was this month in 1972, 49 years ago, that that man there, uh, Richard Nixon, who I knew, covered him, uh, 1985, changed the lives of, well, now more than hundreds of millions of American women by putting his name and signing off on a bill called Title IX, which gave women equal educational opportunities to men in colleges, which meant women could be more than just nurses and secretaries and teachers, although some women did own their own businesses, but professionally, they had a chance of becoming doctors, lawyers, engineers, etc. all thanks to this guy, Richard Nixon. Uh, the law that he signed, it was called Title IX, or the Patsy T. Mink Equal Opportunity and Education Act. The Education Amendments of 1972 were Title IX. In 1971, it was the Oregon Congresswoman, uh, Edith Green, along with Patsy Mink, the Congresswoman from Hawaii, that uh, decided to push ahead and try to get this bill signed, which would give women an opportunity to pursue their dreams without gender discrimination. And uh, Mink and Green, along with some help in the Senate from Birch Bayh and Ted Stevens, were able to take off and get the law done. But before we talk about the impact of the law, which was signed uh, by Nixon on June 23rd, 1972, let's talk about women prior to 1972. Like, uh, well, I'm in San Francisco in November of 2019, and there's a great place in San Francisco which has old uh, Nickelodeons and old pinball machines and uh, all that type of stuff. And um, anyway, uh, it's called the uh, Music, uh, the uh, Magnificent Museum, or the Magnificent Museum. And uh, you go in there and you see the uh, things like this, an old Nickelodeon. Uh, from the 19 teens. And uh, this one says, to be happy, see what every married woman must not avoid. Meaning that every married woman had to make sure her husband was happy. At least that was the 19 teens thinking. Uh, June 23rd, 1972, Title IX of the Education Amendments is enacted by Congress, signed into law by Nixon. The uh, sponsors uh, in the Senate, Birch by Indiana Democrat, Edith Green, Oregon Democrat House of Representatives. Title IX prohibits sex discrimination in any educational program or activity receiving any type of federal financial aid. Um, you know, I've done this talk before and some um, women have gotten upset at me because I point this out. This is the West Orange Public Library, the West Orange Public Library, Library Board of Trustees, at the dedication of the new library in West Orange, New Jersey. And uh, Mrs. Simon J. Griffinger was the president of the Library Board of Trustees. She doesn't have a first name. Samuel A. Cristiano does, Roger W. Doring does, Herbert J. Dwyer does, but Mrs. Alex J. Katz, and she doesn't have a first name. James J. Sheehan, or Sheeran, the mayor of West Orange. He does, and Dr. Rexford S. Souther, the superintendent of schools, he does, and the architect, William E. Lehman, does as well. Uh, back in those days, uh, if you were married, uh, you would get, say, a wedding invitation, and on the wedding invitation, it would say Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so. Um, and uh, my mother-in-law was a member of, uh, of a group that raised money for a, a, another group, and every year, her name would be in the uh, local newspaper, along with the other women. They would say, Mr. and Mrs. Edwin Schaefer. She didn't have a name, nor did anybody else have a name in that group. And um, that was the way it was, and it was very accepted. I had a woman up in Riverdale, at the Riverdale Y, say to me, um, 
I'm disappointed in you. I said, why are you disappointed? She says, here I am. I'm 82 years old. And for the first time in my life, I found out you told me I didn't have a name. And now that I think of it, I didn't have a name. Morris was, he was a good provider and he was a great husband for me, but uh, I didn't have a name. Now I know I didn't have a name. I said, you have a name right now. Anyway, um, so that was just the way it was. Hey, look, you wanted to be a stewardess back in, for Delta Airlines back 56 years ago? This was an ad. Welcome aboard Delta, 1965. You want to be a stewardess, stewardess applications. Must be between the ages of 20 and 26. Never married and really in good health. Must adhere to strict figure control standards. 34, 24, 34. That was ideal. I was doing this talk in Chicago about a month and a half ago, and this woman told me she was a stewardess. She was at United Airlines, and they actually took a tape measure to make sure that her measurements did not change. Didn't change. Couldn't get away with it today, but you could in 1965. Straight teeth and legs, clear, smooth skin. Willing to retire between the ages of 30 and 32 to take on the greater complexities of marriage. Qualified young women can contact the uh, base stewardess uh, supervisor in Delta cities. And that's all. Hey, make sure you had straight teeth, uh, straight legs, and uh, make sure you kept your weight down. That's the only way you could be a stewardess. Oh, and by the time you were 32, out the door, because you should be married. Are you a working gal? Alan Ludden on Password. There he is with Carol Burnett and Mitch Miller. When women contestants would come on, Alan uh, Ludden would ask uh, one or two questions. Are you a working gal or what does your husband do for a living? This is the mid 1960s. And this is going on. I mean, in all segments of life. That's Patsy Mink, Congresswoman from Hawaii. She's a great athlete uh, at her high school and she was the valedictorian of her high school in Maui in 1944. Meant she should have gone on to bigger and greater things. And she did, but it was a struggle to do so. Uh, she was the first female president of the student body at Maui High School. She became the valedictorian of her graduating class in 1944. She went to law school, then went back to Hawaii. She became politically ambitious in 1958, she was elected to the territory of Hawaii Senate. Uh, Senate. Uh, the uh, bicameral territory legislature was dissolved when Hawaii became a state. And uh, she ran in a special election to represent um, a House member from Congress in 1960. Uh, she would lose to the Democrat, uh, Daniel Inouye, in the primary. By 1962, she ran for election to the Hawaiian State Senate and was successful in her bid. Two years later, she was victorious in her race and she made it to Congress. She was an early supporter of a successful effort to allow female members of Congress to use the heretofore all-male gym in the House. Wait a minute, she's a full House member, right? She's sworn in and she's a representative from Hawaii and yet, you know, she's supposed to be a full congresswoman, except she couldn't use the male gym. They wouldn't allow her to use the gym in 1966. Uh, and she fought, and eventually she was allowed. Only men, men only, gotta remember the time. Uh, she was a champion of women's rights. She w did not want to be called a feminist. Uh, in the 1960s, she became outspoken against the Vietnam War. Uh, but basically, she was working on behalf of legislation uh, in the field of civil rights. She was a Hawaiian Japanese woman, uh, including those of women and children, as well as health care, welfare, and education. Her problem stems from this. She went to uh, college, University of Hawaii. She was valedictorian in 1944, and uh, she would apply to medical school. Twelve times she was rejected. She thought it was because of gender discrimination. Um, I have stories of people that I have known over the years, uh, talking about Hawaii. I have a friend named Fran Cummings who lives in Hawaii, who in the uh, 1950s uh, was uh, the valedictorian of her uh, school back in Utah, high school. Uh, she was a Mormon. 
Um, and um, she came from a long line of geologists, and she wanted to be a geologist. After all, her family was a geologist or was in the geology uh, field. And she would go from school to school to school to school, and uh, she'd get rejected, 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 rejected. One day she decides to ask, How come I got rejected? And the guy who rejected her said, Hey, Fran, Fran Cummings is her name. Fran, let me tell you something. Your marks are great. Everything is great about you, but I can't accept you. Well, why can't you accept me? Again, remember, since 1956, 57, somewhere around there, why can't you accept me? Well, Fran, you're too pretty. And if we go out on a geological dig, um, the guys are gonna concentrate on you, not on their studies. And, um, you know, because of that, you know, you're qualified and all. I hate to tell you this, but no, nah, can't come here because you're too pretty. Lots of stories like that. Um, an awful lot of stories like that. Patsy Mink decided, okay, let's go to law school. And she goes to law school. And she faces sexism because she's denied a job at a law firm because she was a married woman. And then she started to her, try to start her own practice. But uh, Hawaiian territorial officials told her uh, only residents of Hawaii are allowed to take the bar exam. She had been born in Hawaii. She grew up in Maui, uh, but she married a mainlander. And uh, they told her, mm, you're a mainlander now because you married the guy from the mainland. So you're not a resident of Hawaii anymore, so you can't take the bar exam. I can't take the bar exam. Uh, she fought and she won in court. And she became the first uh, Japanese American woman lawyer in Hawaiian history. She was the Hawaiian congressman from uh, 1965 to 1977, and then again, 1992, 2002. There's Patsy Mink on the left, and there is Edith Green on the right. Edith Green, in November of 1954, was elected as the representative for Oregon's third congressional district. Um, her forte, women's issues education, and social reform. In 1955, she proposed the Equal Pay Act to ensure that men and women were paid equally for equal work. The bill was signed into law eight years later and was never applied evenly. To this day, there are men who get paid more in the same job that a woman has. And even though they're not supposed to, the law was never applied equally. And there is Edith Green, Democrat for Congress. Uh, she was known as the mother of higher education, the Library Services Act, which provided access to libraries for rural communities. Uh, also, uh, the uh, Higher Education Facilities Act of 1963, the Higher Education Act of 1965, 1967. Green's commitment to education earned her uh, names like the mother of higher education and Mrs. Education. I went to uh, junior high school in the late 1960s. I was in junior high school from 1967 to 1970. And uh, after school programs existed for guys, there were teams. There were hardly any uh, programs up in Spring Valley, New York and Rockland County for women. And Green noted that around the country. And she pointed out that uh, after school programs existed for boys in school, but not for girls. And she sought to correct this inequity or inequality. Uh, she introduced a higher education bill that contained provisions regarding gender uh, equality or equity in education. This looks like assault. This is the Boston Marathon in 1967. Jock Semple, the guy in the suit, really, really, really upset that this woman, Kay Switzer, is running in this marathon. It's supposed to be men only, the Boston Marathon. That's supposed to be women, men only. Well, um, he's trying to knock her over and get her out of the race. Catherine Switzer grew up as the daughter of a major in the United States Army, so failure was never really an option for her. Uh, she was at Syracuse University, and she enters the uh, Boston Marathon for 1967. Kay Switzer, not Catherine Switzer, Kay Switzer. They had no idea that she was a woman, but they accepted her. She got in. Uh, she told one of her coaches, uh, I'm running the Boston Marathon. And the coach laughed. Fragile woman, 
you can't run the Boston Marathon. So she trained in secret and entered the race. Always cracks me up the weaker sex, uh, the fairer sex. If they're such, if women are such the weaker sex, how come they outlive men? And as Myron Cohen would say, because the men want them to. Myron lived on New Hempstead Road, New City, New York, down the dip, uh, up in Rockland County. What's at his house? And there is an uh, old jock trying to knock Catherine Switzer out, but her boyfriend then, who was a nationally ranked uh, track and field guide, knocked over Jock Semple, and she was able to complete the race. The boyfriend was 235 pounds, nationally ranked hammer thrower, who only entered the race because she entered the race, and he wanted to see if he could do the race. She said she was going to complete it. She did, four hours and 20 minutes. Title IX, no person in the United States shall on the basis of sex be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or subjected to discrimination under any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. Title IX was highly controversial. A lot of men didn't like it. A lot of men didn't like it. Why? Well, men, some supported the law, but others said, be too dangerous way too dangerous. You're forcing schools to accept women. That would ruin American education, some felt. It's a guy up in Stanford about 12 years ago at the atrium in Stanford. And uh, a, a guy who went to medical school in around uh, 1960, or it was in 1960. And he said there were 96 uh, students in the class. And the uh, dean of the school walks in, and he tells everybody to sit down. And then he tells the women to stand up and say, why are you here? Why are you here? Um, and, uh, and then he says, you know, you're taking the spot of a man. You're going to be here. You're not going to complete school, or you're going to waste our time when a man could be there. You're going to look for a husband here. That's all you want, look for a husband. There was a major ally in the, the Senate, Ted Stevens, who was the senator from Alaska. And um, he had girls, he had girls, and he pushed uh, for Title IX. Uh, Stevens' law career took him to Fairbanks, Alaska, the territory of Alaska, where he was appointed the U.S. Attorney in 1953. In 1956, he returns to Washington to work in the Eisenhower administration, the Interior Department, and he plays an important role in bringing statehood to Alaska. He's elected to the Alaska House of Representatives in 1964, becomes the House Majority Leader in uh, 1966. In 1968, he ran unsuccessfully for the Republican nomination for U.S. Senate, but in 1969, Alaska's other Senate seat becomes vacant, and he's appointed to that seat. As a senator, he played key roles in legislation that shaped Alaska's economic and social development, including the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, the Trans-Alaska Pipeline Authorization Act, the Alaska National Interest Lands Conservation Act, and the Magnuson-Stevens Fishery Conservation and Management Act, and Title IX. He was known for his sponsorship of the Amateur Sports Act of 1978, which resulted in the establishment of the United States Olympic Committee. The Alaska Statehood Act was signed by President Dwight Eisenhower July 7th, 1958, which allowed Alaska to become the 49th state on January 3rd, 1959. And there is my old friend Donna Deverona. Donna Deverona won two gold medals at the Tokyo Olympics in 1964, as a 17-year-old, as I told, tell Donna, you can't hide your age. Everybody knows you won those two medals at the age of 17 in 1964. Anyway, um, Donna uh, wants to go to Stanford University and figured the two gold medals in her back pocket would help her get a scholarship uh, to Stanford University to compete on the swimming team there. She never got it. Never got it. Uh, she was denied. Didn't have to tell her why. Just state you're denied. Uh, Donna said, without Senator Stevens as a co-sponsor, I doubt Title IX would have survived. It was a time when we needed a strong Republican. He championed the rights of athletes and protected Title IX. 
as well as always being there when there was a challenge to the law. Why Title IX? Why Ted Stevens? Well, he was an avid tennis player, and he was able to see the value in sports and recreation reflected in both his professional and personal lives. His daughters benefited from playing in sports. Title IX provided women's equality in sports, and that is a major problem. That is my friend Harvey Schiller from Brooklyn. Harvey's a little bit of a wackadoo. He uh, had shoulder replacement a couple of years ago, and his profile picture on uh, Facebook was the screw in the shoulder. He had shoulder replacement. Anyway, uh, there's Harvey, uh, who is the head of a major uh, collegiate athletic uh, conference, the Southeast Conference, and Ted Stevens and Donna on the right. And there's Birch Bay. You know, uh, in 1969, I went to uh, Spring Valley Junior High School. It's in ninth grade. I had a teacher by the name of Stewie Gates, social studies teacher. We we're learning about uh, Africa and independent countries and also red China and communist China. Well, I don't know if we we're supposed to learn about that. We were supposed to learn about colonization in Africa uh, being broken in 1960. Uh, but he always reminded us about uh, it's red China and communist China, not the People's Republic of China. But anyway, uh, Stewie, uh, here we are, we're in ninth grade. I'm uh, either uh, 12 or thir uh, rather 13 or 14 years old. I'm a year ahead um, because I was thrown in a kindergarten. I was thrown into first grade because I was too much to handle in kindergarten. Uh, so anyway, presumably everybody is older than me. And uh, I think they were because I've asked other people about, do you remember the Stewie Gates talk? And no, they don't uh, after all these years, but they say you probably do because you don't forget anything. Anyway, Stewie Gates is giving us a talk. We're in ninth grade. Next year or next September, we're going up to 10th grade, Spring Valley Senior High School, totally different building. And we're going to take the PSATs, the practice SATs. In 11th grade, we're going to take the SATs. And um, that's where we're going to find out if we're college material or not. Um, which we all found out, of course, we were college material. And then in 12th grade, we go looking for a college, wherever that college is. And then he said, well, some of you uh, girls here in the class, uh, you know, you're going to go, you know, somebody's going to pick this, 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 and this. And, but some of you girls, you're only going to college to major in three letters, MRS, MRS. And he left it at that. Birch Bayh in 1972 introduced the Title IX of the Higher Education Amendments uh, into the Senate. He authored uh, the bill, and it was for the first time would prohibit discrimination on the basis of sex in the classroom, on the athletic field, also protecting the students and the faculty. And there is Birch Bayh, an older picture of him, or when he was older, a newer picture of him. Um, so he gets on the Senate floor, and he says this. Uh, we're all familiar with the stereotype that women are pretty things who go to college to find a husband. Sounds just like Stewie Gates here. Uh, and who go on to graduate school because they want more, a more interesting husband and finally marry, have children, and never work again. Just like that guy I talked about in Stanford when he went to uh, medical school where the four women had to stand up and get uh, yelled at because they were going to medical school. The desire of many schools not to waste a man's place on the women stems from such stereotype notions. The facts absolutely contradict these myths about the weaker sex. And it's time to change our operating assumptions. While the impact of this amendment would be far reaching, it's not a panacea. It is, however, an important first step in the effort to provide for the women of America, something that is rightfully theirs, an equal chance to attend the schools of their choice, to develop the skills they want and apply those skills. With the knowledge, they will have a fair chance to secure the jobs of their choice with equal pay for equal work. Title IX was enacted as a follow-up to the passage of the Civil Rights Act in 1964. The 1964 Act was passed to end discrimination in various fields based on race, color, religion, sex, or national origin in the areas of employment and public accommodation. But the 1964 Act did not prohibit sex discrimination 
against persons employed at educational institutions, which meant, hey, you don't want a woman here? Don't have to tell you. Don't have to tell you too pretty to be here. You don't have to know. We just don't want you. And the other thing is, uh, in addition to that, was that uh, in terms of women and uh, their career trajectory, getting tenure or not, we don't have to give you tenure. And guess what? We don't have to tell you why you're not getting tenure. Women students were denied equal opportunities under the law and academics. Women applicants were routinely denied access to medical law in other graduate schools and women athletes denied equal participation in sports. Female faculty members were denied equal compensation and promotion. Today's rise of women in all academic disciplines and in sports at every level in many ways is a direct outgrowth of the landmark Title IX legislation. Uh, Congress passed the final version of the bill, June 1972, and Nixon signs it into law June 23rd. There have been many, many times in the last 49 years where the law has been challenged. Title IX has gone back to Congress more times than most laws, 24 times. By 2007, the last time Rod Brooks, uh, the education secretary under George W. Bush, sent out a questionnaire asking uh, students whether Title IX was still needed or not. Um, it is. Uh, and, uh, yeah, uh, sign the bill. Yeah, sign the bill. And he does. And he doesn't talk about it. Dixon doesn't talk about it. He's about ready to change the lives of hundreds of millions of American women plus women overseas who come to study in the United States doesn't say a word about it. Um, he speaks about the segregation and busing, but he doesn't mention a word about the expansion of educational access for women that he was, he enacted. Doesn't say a word about it, just goes away. Bernice Sadler was an activist and she said, God bless you, Tunnel 9. Uh, if girls, and she talks about this, uh, or wrote about this, about uh, if girls got pregnant, they were literally kicked out of the schools back in the day, in the 50s, in the 60s. Very often, people knew who the father was. He didn't receive any punishment at all. Women teachers also faced tough consequences for getting pregnant, routinely losing their jobs when they began to show. In New York, uh, at one time, if you were a woman teacher in the New York City educational system, you could not get married. Uh, that's Bernice Guerra. Uh, she was a Queens housewife. And in the 1960s, she was questioning what was it all about? And uh, she talks to her husband and says, you know, there's got to be more to life than me just put a spring pledge on a, a table and, and dusting. There's got to be more than life. And he says, well, what do you like? She said, baseball. And they said together, hey, let me become an umpire. Well, she does. She goes to umpiring school, and she does rather well. Uh, and she receives a contract from the National Association of Professional Baseball Leagues to work in the Class A short season New York Penn League, which doesn't exist anymore. Uh, and she receives a telegram after she gets the job offer from the then president of the National Association of Professional Baseball Leagues, a guy by the name of Philip Pitton, saying, your contract is disapproved and invalid. That was it. Well, she wasn't going to take this lying down. She decided to sue. And after three years, Bernice Guerra does get on the baseball field to umpire. Uh, the New York State Division of Rights versus New York Pennsylvania Professional Baseball League, the court ruled in 1972 that being a man is not a bona fide occupational qualification for umpires. The woman in blue, Bernice Guerra, finally gets to umpire a game, and that would be her entire career. Uh, June 24th, 1972, she does umpire a game between the Geneva Rangers and the Auburn Phillies up in upstate New York, and uh, she gets to the hotel, which was not exactly uh, the Ritz-Carlton or the Waldorf Astoria, more like Hotel Six, because that's the way it is in minor league baseball. And she's, and she's greeted by eight protesters at the hotel. Eight protesters yelling, a woman's place is in the home, not behind home plate. She was not wanted. The other umpires didn't want her either. She was the ultimate outsider. 
an interloper. Uh, and here she is. Uh, she is uh, working the bases in 1972. And uh, it was the only game she ever, ever, ever uh, appeared in because she gets screamed and yelled at by this guy, the manager of the Philadelphia Phillies minor league affiliate. Uh, his name is Nolan Campbell. And uh, there was a play, and Guerra reverses the double play call. Um, she resigns between games of the double header, citing lack of cooperation from her fellow umpires. And Campbell told her she should be in the kitchen peeling potatoes. What apparently got to her was the other umpire who uh, escorted uh, Campbell off the field and, and holding, putting his arm around uh, him in solidarity. Hey, that woman doesn't belong here. You should be in the kitchen peeling potatoes. She would end up working for the New York Mets in community relations. Uh, my father was a uh, father-in-law was a groupie, big time groupie, sports groupie. And he took a lot of pictures with a lot of sports people uh, back in the 1980s when I would take him out. This is at the 21 Club and that's Billie Jean King. And now I'm kind of happy that I have pictures of him uh, with Billie Jean King back in the day because I could use them because Billie Jean King is really important to this whole uh, women's movement um, in her field, which was sports. She was a civil rights pioneer and she captured people's attention long before that uh, paper, or that, that, that stupid TV show, Battle of the Sexes, the showdown against uh, Bobby Riggs at the Houston Astrodome in 1973, which was put together by my friend, the late Shelley Saltman. It was a TV show, it was a, it was a spectacle. It really wasn't anything of importance as we have found out 48 years later, but uh, at the time it was a big deal. Uh, while Patsy Mink is pushing ahead to get the gym opened at the uh, House of Representatives in Washington, women's tennis, the whole world was stalled in old world traditions that left women athletes as second class citizens. Billie Jean King was referred to as Mrs. King. Uh, at Wimbledon, and she wasn't going to take any of that. Uh, she grew up on the streets playing tennis uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area. She wasn't one of these country club people, which probably made them upset even more. Uh, in 1967, Billie Jean King took on the United States Lawn Tennis Association and its policy of paying top players under the table to guarantee that they would come into tournaments. She denounced the USLTA's practices as corrupt, and kept the game highly elitist. And they were gonna get even with her eventually. It would take time, but they would get even with her. Uh, she complained about the money. Uh, she wins 750 sterling pounds, winning Wimbledon in 1968, while Rod Laver, uh, the Australian men's tennis player, took 2,000 pounds as the winner. The total purses for the competition, 14,800 uh, pounds for men, 5,680 pounds for women. And hey, the ticket prices were absolutely the same for men and women, but women were regarded as second class citizens. At the 1970 Italian Open, the men's singles champion, the Romanian, Ili Nastasi, was paid $3,500 US, while King got just $600. Uh, the USLTA would get even with her. No tournaments in 1970. Absolutely no tournaments for you. And uh, Billie Jean King uh, and the other women decide, hey, we're not going to put up with this. Um, King pushed for equal prize money in men's and women's games. She uh, won the 1972 Open. $15,000 less money uh, went into her pocket than the men's champion, Nastasi. And she says, I'm sitting out the 73 Open out in Forest Hills if the money is not equal by next year. Well, the Forest Hills people decided, yeah, well, we'll give you the same amount of money as the men's champion. Uh, but she almost didn't qualify for the 1972 US Open. Uh, tennis is probably the uh, as, as well developed a global sport as any in the world, except for soccer, uh, maybe golf, maybe not. Probably tennis better than golf. Uh, there were four major championships, four different countries that attract the best men and women players in the world. The Australian in January, uh, the French Open in May and June, the Wimbledon uh, in England, June and July, the U.S. Open 
out at uh, Flushing Meadows in August and September. And separately, there are tours for men and women globally, although that may be coming together uh, because there's some talk of that now. You've come a long way, baby, to get to where you are today. You've got your own cigarette now, baby. You've come a long way. As condescending as that sounds, uh, Virginia Slim cigarette is introduced around 1969. And uh, the ad spoke directly to women, directly to women. And uh, the Virginia Slim circuit would be born soon after that. It was formed in 1970. The Virginia Slim circuit became the basis for the latter uh, WTA tour. Uh, the players, uh, the original nine, rebelled against the United States Lawn Tennis Association for a number of reasons, including the wide inequity and the amount prize money was paid to the players. Male players got a lot more. And also, uh, the 1970 calendar vanished for the women. Uh, but there was a, a, a guy in Houston who decided he was going to put together a tournament for women. And he got Virginia Slims to pay for it. The nine women who decided to play there, Billie Jean King, Rosie Casals, Nancy Ritchie, Peaches Barkowitz, Kirsty Pigeon, Valerie Ziegenfuss, Julie Heldman, Carrie Melville-Reed, and Judy Taggart-Dalton all put their careers on the line because the USLTA said, if you participate here, you're not going to play anywhere else. And they said, I, we dare you. We absolutely dare you. We want to see you do it. Um, and um, they dared the USLTA, and they decide to play. And the USLTA back down. Uh, as far as uh, the Virginia Slims, I talked to Billie Jean King about the, the Slims tournament. I said, why'd you take the money? Why'd you take what you refer to as blood money? She said, because nobody wanted us. We banged on every door of Madison Avenue. If they opened the door, if we're lucky enough, to, they opened the door, they slammed it shut in our face. Um, a lot of them didn't even bother opening the door. Virginia Slims uh, and Philip Morris, they were the only ones who said, hey, you know what, we'll, we'll sponsor you. And they were hoping that uh, they would get somebody else other than cigarettes because the Surgeon General in 1964 said cigarettes were hazardous to your health. Uh, but they never could. Uh, Billie Jean King is confronted in 1983 uh, by uh, anti-cigarette uh, smokers group. And uh, they said, how come you took the money? And she said, I believe in the free enterprise system. It's up to the woman herself to make that choice whether to smoke or not smoke. The most important thing is that we're well informed and that we make our own decision. Um, it's blood money. It's blood money. Ellen Merlo was the director of marketing and communications for Philip Morris USA at the time, which made the Virginia Slim cigarette. And she said, hey, look, we sponsored the tour from 1971 to 78. When we get involved in any promotion, it's obviously to create a greater visibility for our brand name, but we never ever ask the player to endorse our product. Not true, not true. He used to go, I went to a few of these. Uh, because I had to cover it, uh, these, these tournaments. And there was Virginia Slim signage all over the place, bags, gifts, whatever. Uh, so by playing in the Virginia Slims tournament, you were basically supporting the sponsor and the sponsor's product, cigarettes. Brandy Chastain, 1999, Brandy Chastain was a member of the United States women's uh, soccer team that won the World Cup. And we were talking about this one day and talking about why women's sports up until recently were struggling to get money. Uh, that's changed in the last few years. Uh, why, why were they struggling to get money? And she said, simply, we need a good old girls network. We need women CEOs women CFOs, women running companies, and making decisions on spending. We need a good old girls network. Oh, Billie Jean King told me something else, and some of you probably were impacted by this. Um, you couldn't get your own credit card, major credit card. You could probably get Bonwood Teller or maybe Macy's, uh, stores that uh, basically uh, cater to women. Uh, but banks required uh, single or divorced or widowed women to bring in a man with them when they 
went for a credit card to so co sign for a credit card. And um, some of that, um, what the women's earnings, when they looked at it, it was discounted by 50% when calculating their credit cards. Well, it was good for Bonwood Teller because you were going to spend in Bonwood Teller and they wanted women customers, not necessarily good for the uh, Diners Club card. In 1974, the Senate passed the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, which made it illegal to discriminate against someone based on their gender, race, religion, national origin. Nixon signs it into law. Billie Jean King told me, yeah, I'm making all the money uh, in the family. She's married to Larry King, a lawyer at that time, not the Larry King that was on TV. And she said, it was ridiculous. He had to co-sign for my credit card, even though I'm making my own money. There was a bank for women that opened up in Manhattan. Uh, it was called the uh, First Women's Bank, opened up by Judy H. Mello, who was part of that Betty Friedan, uh, Gloria Stein and Bella Abza group. Uh, the bank was a creation of the feminist movement, established in April 1975. It was a bank, the first bank in the United States operated by women, for women, at a time when its founders said women were given the short shrift by other banks. Eventually, the bank would go away because other banks decided to open up their banking to women. Uh, the first women's bank was languishing by 1986, and it was sold to a group of investors and folded into another banking group. Uh, but as late as 2012, uh, women were still being discriminated against. They still paid more for credit cards. According to a study by the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, women paid a half point higher interest rate than men. So what is Title IX and what did it exactly do? Well, it opened the door for women in sports and other fields, including medicine and the law. The sports part is a big problem. Title IX bars sex discrimination in any education program or activities that receive federal funding, including athletics. And Donna Deverona said, if we had it to do all over again, we would drop the name athletic or the word athletics and just said across the board, all educational opportunities because athletics allegedly is an educational opportunity in colleges. Title IX, there's Birch By with the Purdue track and field team after the bill is um, signed into law. Title IX, according to Donna Deverona, was a civil rights act applied to education. Uh, and she continues to go to Washington to lobby to make sure that Title IX never gets watered down. Basically, it said law school, medical school. Sports was thrown in, and that's a problem. At the inception, opponents of the law argued that girls and women were not interested in elite sports participation and opening up new opportunities would not only undermine men's sports, but bankrupt school sports budgets nationwide. Well, first, let's not educate women because it's going to ruin education. Okay, we'll educate women. Oh, and now uh, we got a problem because the sports budgets would be wrecked. John Tower in 1974 was the first guy to go after Title IX. Uh, on May 20th, he uh, proposed the Tower Amendment, which would exempt revenue producing sports like football from the, uh, from, uh, the determinations of Title IX compliance. He loses. However, he wins in the battle of uh, public opinion because even though he lost, uh, because of the way he put it out there, Title IX became a sports equity law, not an anti-discrimination civil rights law. And that has stuck since 1974, 47 years later. Jacob Javits, the New York Republican liberal senator was the next one to try to do something against Title IX. Uh, he submits an amendment directing the Health, Education, and Welfare Department to issue uh, regulations that provide for reasonable provisions considering the nature of particular sports that clarifies that event and uniform expenditures on sports with larger crowds or more expensive equipment do not have to be matched in sports without similar needs. Outfit the football team. Oh, the baseball team, rags are good for them. Old hand-me-down uniforms, good enough. And girls, bring your own glove. Bring your own gloves and bats. 
this. We, if that would help us if we didn't have to supply it. And then here's Walter Byers. He was the guy who was the head of the National Collegiate Athletic Association who was supposed to look after every student athlete, every student athlete. But in 1976, on February 17th, the NCAA charges the legality of Title IX. Why? They probably want to save college football. Uh, they lose as well. This year, or last year, there was a female who finally suited up in football, a kicker by the name of Sarah Fuller. Um, she played because Vanderbilt needed a kicker. Uh, the fight is all about sports now. Title IX changed how colored sports played in the country. Before 1972, the U.S. Account General Accounting Office released a figure showing that 32,000 women had participated in college sports. That grew to 163,000 by 1999 and 216,378 by 2018. Men no longer get 95% of the dollars earmarked for sports and the coaching fraternity, the men's teams, their coaches are upset because they feel that uh, Title IX has taken away their ability to get the best athletes for their teams because they can't spend scholarship money solely for men's teams. Uh, Title IX, Title IX equaled the playing field, uh, but that was supposed to be an education, not sports, not sports. Initially, Title IX's intent Give women a fair chance of being accepted at the school, like my old friend Fran to become a geologist. She ended up okay. She majored in education. And uh, Fran, Fran Cummings, so I spoke about at the beginning of the talk, ended up running college uh, departments, which isn't bad. And her husband was a professor at those colleges. And also for women professors to get an equal opportunity at advancing within the system. Title IX worked. By 1994, women received 38% of medical degrees earned in the United States compared to just 9% in, in 1972. 43% of the law degrees compared with 7% in 1972 and 44% of all doctoral degrees up from 25% in 1975. But that's kind of hard to figure that out because some of those doctoral degrees may have started 10 years earlier. But anyway, 44%. Now more women go to law school, more women go to medical school than men. Title IX has created diversity in society, just not a piece of sports legislation. There is my buddy, Shelley Saltman, one of the five most influential men in women's sports in 1970. He passed away two years ago. I know, Shelley, you're listening now because I know your ears are burning and you're trying to get your phone to call me, but wherever you are, they don't have any phones. We'll meet again one day. Pre-1972, very few women lawyers, doctors, scientists, uh, nurse, teacher, secretary, careers for most women. Girls didn't play too many sports. Girls took square dancing and home economics. Post-1972 in sports, it'd be no Jenny Finch, no world championship soccer team, no WNBA, no Misty May trainer, no Kerry Walsh, no Lindsey Vaughn. Every athlete, every female athlete in the United States today has benefited from Title IX in one way or other. Or how about women scientists, women mathematicians, women computer analysts, women doctors, women lawyers, women politicians? Oh, there were some before 1972, but women got into uh, the mainstream of jobs by this legislation passed by Nixon. However, however, there's still some remnants. During COVID-19, women found out in sports they're still second-class citizens. That picture on the left, that's the men's gym set up for the men's college basketball tournament in Indianapolis. On the right, oh, that's the women's weight room for their tournament down in Texas. Uh, they just didn't get a big time assortment of equipment like the men did. Uh, the men's basketball tournament was held in 2021 in March and April in Indianapolis. The men's teams were given better COVID-19 tests, while people connected to the women's teams in San Antonio got a less accurate COVID-19 test. Uh, the training equipment available to the women's teams not equal to what the men received. Oh, the food on the left, 
That's what the women were able to get. On the right, it's what the men got. This looks like there's a slight discrepancy in the men's food and the women's food. And this is just last March, 2021. Food options limited. And there were complaints about the swag bags, the gifts given the players. The men got better gifts. This is 2021. The NCAA is still mired prior to 1972. Yeah, there was an apology by this guy, Dr. Mark Ebert, who just got a new contract through 2025, despite the fact that he has this fiasco on his hands last March. Uh, he said, well, none of this should have happened, but it did. Men and women did not get equal treatment in the COVID-19 bubble environment. The future, hands off Title IX. Hands off Title IX. Don't touch it. There are a lot of women lawyers out there. If they did try to touch it, it'd be a problem. Title IX, try weakening Title IX with a whole bunch of women uh, lawyers out there. Um, hands off Title IX. As I leave you with this, and uh, I will be leaving you with this now, women need to know that education is not a right. It's guaranteed through federal law. And there are some provisions. Title IX isn't perfect. Nothing is perfect. In fact, there are pro the, pro the problem now is sexual assault on college campuses. And Title IX does not provide protection necessarily against women with college assaults uh, against them uh, on, on college campuses. And that loophole needs to be tightened. And nobody in Washington seems to be wanting to do that. But women do get education today. That needs to be adjusted. That needs to be attended to. And uh, maybe one day it will be attended to. But women need to know. And you got to tell this to your daughters, your granddaughters, your great granddaughters, and keep telling them that because I do to my daughter and I am going to do it to my granddaughter who's just two years old. Be, be diligent. Make sure you know what's going on with Title IX because they may be somebody or some group of people, elected officials who decided, you know what, we've given women enough rights, you know, why do they need equal rights in school? Happened in 2007, it could happen again. Uh, I want to thank uh, Wendy. Oh, speaking of politicians, there is uh, Governor uh, Linda Lingle of Hawaii in 2005. Um, Hawaii seems to have been one place where women did succeed politically, Patsy Mick, Governor Lingle, uh, and others. So um, Hawaii, of course, Hawaii was a republic uh, before uh, it was a territory of the United States and set up uh, differently. Um, but anyway, uh, that was Governor uh, Linda Lingle. Anyway, thank you, Wendy, for inviting me. Uh, if you have any questions or any comments, uh, let me know uh, if you have any questions or comments. Anybody, questions or comments? Okay, no questions, no comments. So uh, you do have a question or are you saying goodbye? I can't hear you. And, and uh, your name. 